thank you for your faithfulness to us and um, for the privilege of being down here and studying the Word. Lord, be with us today as we uh, meditate on things of your Word and as Dr. Klein uh, teaches us, Lord, may his words be your words to us. Help us to learn and to absorb the information, but not just in our minds, but in our hearts. And bless us this day and everyone here at ALC in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. A big uh, session, four sessions today. First of all, I uh, will finish work on Genesis and then we'll start uh, work on Exodus. Now, we were looking at the pattern of sin and blessing. You just put it down here. Sin and blessing. In Genesis 1 through to the beginning of chapter 12, and a certain pattern that's established, human beings sin, God's judgment comes on them, and God's judgment is always against sin, limiting sin and its consequences. God judges in order to save people from sin, and then uh, that leads to God's act of preservation. Um, Probably if you sit there, it's probably easier than if it's a bit squeezed or here. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, and then you get God's act of blessing. Now, the remarkable thing is that God's blessing continues to people in a fallen world, bringing good out of evil. Um, and that culminates in the story of the flood, where God intervenes to stop sin from getting out of hand, so that the world that he's created doesn't revert to chaos. But even after the flood, God hasn't solved the problem, and you get a kind of a second story of the fall. Now, to understand the story of the Tower of Babel, you need to know that people in the ancient world built temples on top of mountains. Built temples on top of mountains. Why on top of mountains? Because mountains were the place where closest to the gods so if you wanted to enter the heavenly realm you went up a mountain now that's paganism and you'll still see it in India for example to the present day um, and where they didn't have mountains as for example in present day Iraq uh, present day uh, uh, Mesopotamia a uh, place like Babel Babylon uh, they built artificial mountains called ziggurats. Have you heard, seen them? Yep. Okay, there's, you can, there's remnants of them still there. Artificial mountains made of bricks. And on top, these mountains were called the gate to heaven, ziggurats. And uh, the priests would then go on top of the ziggurat in order to enter the heavenly realm to do their astrological observance, uh, to find out what the will of the gods was, and so that they could rule together with the gods. Okay, access to the heavenly realms. Human beings wanted to, wanting not just to be like God, but to enter the heavenly realm and to exercise supernatural power, divine power. You know the story, they build this tower so that they can um, collectively rule with God. What's God's judgment on the people of Babel who use their technology and their organization politically to build this huge tower? He breaks down communication. They cannot uh, communicate with each other anymore. So that great enterprise for human beings entering the heavenly realm, becoming divine, collapses. But uh, uh, instead of God you know, wiping out these arrogant people, uh, the confusion of languages leads to them being scattered all over the world into the various language groups. And in this way, God ful uh, uh, fulfills his promise, no, his uh, mandate that they are not only to increase and multiply, but they're also to fulfill the earth. So instead of being congregated in one place, they scatter all over the face of the earth. Um, but ultimately, um, out of this comes God's call of Abraham. You get the Semites coming, and from the Semites comes Abraham. These people wanted to make a great name for themselves. What does God call Abraham to be? 
He calls Abraham so that God can make a great name for Abraham. See how the way it's turned around. Which leads us then to the stories of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Very, very important. The patriarchal history from 12 to the end of Genesis. But before we do that and the phone uh, disturbs us, is there any questions? Okay, now let's look at what's one of the most important passages in, not just in Genesis, but in the whole of the Pentateuch and in fact the whole of the Bible. This is a foundational set of commands and promises we have here. Okay, I'll let's start off with you reading, David. Can we go to this very, very, very important passage, Genesis 12, 1 to 7. 12, 1 to 7. Um, and look at it closely. Take note of it. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the lands as far as the site of the great tree of Morah in Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. That'll do. Uh, just the geography here, and it's far reaching. Abraham originally comes from Ur of the Chaldees. Very famous city here. Uh, been excavated, uh, a very famous archaeological site. They come from Ur of the Chaldees, one of the most ancient cities in the Middle East. <laughs> Comes from here, goes up north to Haran, up here, still in the same area, and then God tells him to go to uh, a land that he shows him. And the place that he comes to and builds the first altar is Shechem, which is round about this E here, in the centre of present-day Israel. Now, notice the huge distances. Ur, his first moving is up to Haran, and down to here. Um, uh, very, very uh, famous pagan temple cities, Ur and Haran. Uh, yes. That wouldn't have been common in those days, would it? No, very uncommon. As uncommon as Aboriginals leaving their territory. For an Aboriginal to leave their territory and to, is to commit suicide. Because they cut themselves off from the source of blessing. A blessing which comes through land and the gods of the land through family, clan, custom. So, um, uh, just take note of it, it's very, very unusual. It's, it's, it's totally ridiculous. Because you need to know that Abraham and his wife, Sarah, are childless. Sarah's barren, Abraham's had no children, and he's 75 years old. Sarah is 10 years younger. They have no hope of children, no future. And for a man to leave that, his family, everything else, is plain stupid. It's suicide. Suicidal act. It's a death. Um, a ridiculous demand. So, notice the geography. Now, just a couple of things about uh, uh, the text there before its significance. Uh, uh, what you have here is uh, two commands and six promises which are obscured by the translation. So just follow through. Um, 
I'll give you the Hebrew sentence from verse uh, 1 through to verse 3. Leave your country, your people, your father's house, all the normal sources of blessing, and go to a land I will show you. Now, in Hebrew it is, uh, go from these places to a land I'll show you. So the first command is go. And then verse 2 is so that, so that I will, what? Make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. Three promises there. And then the last part of it, which is translated, and you will be a blessing, is imperative. And be a blessing. So two commands. Go from here and be a blessing. And then there's three promises that come from that. Be a blessing so that I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and so that all peoples actually is clans all clans, tribes on earth will be blessed through you. So two commands go and be a blessing. Go, and God commissions him. Abraham's task is to be a blessing to whom? Everybody. The source of blessing for the whole of humanity. A man without a family is to be a source of blessing to all families. Yes? Yeah, um, just, just the cursing bit. If he's to be a blessing to all... There's a bit of confusion. Is, is there confusion? Well, because he's the means of blessing. If people reject him, they reject God. blessing. <clears throat> yeah? It's as simple as that. Nothing terribly complicated. So, okay, there's no, nothing hidden there. No, it's self evident. Right. Um, I'll strike you down, curse. No, uh, well, uh, that's the result. No, it's not that. And, and it's, it's consequential. Uh, if people acknowledge Abraham as the bearer of blessing, they will receive blessing. Because blessing comes through Abraham from God. If they actually, um, the Hebrew, I can't go into the Hebrew there, if they belittle, if they rubbish, if they reject, if they treat Abraham with contempt, then they will miss out on God's blessing. So it's that, that simple. That it's sort of, that simple. Yeah. Okay. It's that simple. Notice the, um, notice the six promises. The first one, I will make you a great nation. What's funny about that? What's ridiculous about that, David? Um, it was just him and his wife in our 70. Yeah. And uh, what about him and his wife? They are oh, childless, child. infertile. There's no possibility of having any kids. How can a, you know, a man who is as good as dead... How can a great nation come from Abraham and Sarah? Okay? Number one, great nation. What's the second promise? I will bless you. What's funny about that? Because Abraham is as good as cursed in the ancient world. And for most parts of the world to the present day, uh, a mark that you've been blessed by God is to have children. If you don't have children, that shows you are cursed. So, uh, God promises to bless a person who, from a human point of view, is cursed. Thirdly, he promises to make his name great. Now, from a human point of view, how could Abraham alone become a big man, a great man? To be a great man, you have to have an audience. He hasn't got any audience. He becomes a nobody. He leaves his tribe, his people, the people who speak his language, his culture. Um, so it's ridiculous. I will make your name great. And then the last three blessings, uh, he not only promises to make Abraham, uh, 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 to bless Abraham, but more remarkably than that, he promises to bring blessing to people through Abraham. And it's a strange way. It's not so much that blessing comes just through those who will descend from Abraham, but those who acknowledge Abraham as the bearer of God's blessing will receive blessing. Anyone who rejects Abraham, belittles him, 
misses out on God's blessing and God's aim finally is to bless all uh, uh, people on the earth through you um, which later on is uh, explained as through your seed now what is seed? Here, what you get here is through your seed oh. offspring and more narrowly than that it's not all offspring which sex is not included oh, female. female seed through all male offspring so literally seed is semen um, okay through Abraham's seed that means through the uh, sons of Abraham through the descendants of Abraham notice it's it can be singular or plural it can be a or a descendant a male descendant or it can be all male descendants <coughs> Can we just go back to the um, him leaving his country? Because yes. I've moved around a lot, so it really means nothing to me. That's right. That was, he took it as his nephew. Lot. Lot. Yeah. Is that, why would he done that? Was, was that well, because he, uh, um, um, yeah, there's probably a story behind that because Lot had, uh, uh, his father died and he'd adopted him. He was kind of a uh, really. Um, and he had his servants, so there were some servants hangers on. But you need to understand that this is a completely different world. It's a tribal society. Is there any hope for him to somehow make a new life somewhere else? Except Not at the age of 75. Not even for his um, nephew Lot? Well, maybe there would be a hope for him, but not for Abraham. So he could have gone out and acquired some land somewhere. And you just can't buy land in the ancient world. Yeah. It's inherited. Yeah. It's inherited. So he pretty well, he completely stuffed himself by leaving his That's family. right. In every possible way, spiritually through to economically. Um, now, I can't go to all the background of it, but you need yep. to see it's a different world. Now, I've... It's pretty hard for you guys to understand this stuff, but I remember teaching these stories to Aboriginal pastors of Angela State. knew straight away what was going on here. Because this is much closer to their world than ours. Now, I've got to move on. Sorry. Um, right? Uh, now, uh, there's one final thing. Then uh, in, in he, Abraham comes to the land of Canaan, a place called Shechem, and God appears to him there for the first time. Look at verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So you get the promise of land as well. Um, so uh, if you wanted to take, you know, what is God promising here thus far? He promises to make Abraham a blessing. To bless Abraham and to make him a blessing. Uh, people who reject him will miss out. Uh, he promises to give Abraham a great name to make him a great nation and now lastly he promises to give him a land uh, now what's funny about this promise of the land God promises to give him a land that's already occupied by Canaanites it's a funny promise it's like uh, me saying, okay, North Adelaide will belong to you. It's beyond the realm of human possibilities. Uh, now, the last thing is you'll notice again and again throughout Genesis, God appears to Abraham or Isaac and Jacob, and wherever God appears to them, they build an altar. Now, what's the significance of these appearances and the altars? Praise the Lord after seeing him on the altar. Yes. They pray to him, they call on God. He's, he's not, in, not on the mountain. He's not on the mountain. God has come with him he's to the land. Down, down on the land. Okay, and Abraham, God appears here, gives his name to Abraham, and this is the place where Abraham builds an altar, and by building an altar, what does Abraham found? A temple, not a temple, but a holy, a holy, holy, holy place. place, a sanctuary. And if you look at these places, these are 
the places where, which later on when the Israelites came back from Egypt, this is the place where there were sanctuaries, holy places. Why? Because the place where God appeared to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, is the place where God will appear to their descendants. That's the place where they can bring their offerings, altar, where they can access God and his blessing. So it establishes holy places, places of worship, places of sacrifice, places of prayer for people. Good question. Yes. So with the, you know, the people of this day, yes. so the only way they could access God was through the, the temples that um, Abraham or Simon also built once God appeared to them. Um, that's a very modern way of putting it, the only place they could. Um, this, these are the places where they could be sure they had the certainty that they could access God. Um, this is where God had committed himself to appear to them. So if they came and presented their offerings here and prayed to God here, they knew this is the place where God had promised to meet with them. So, yes. would have Jacob been aware of that? Jacob's not here yet. Abraham. Yeah, um, okay. Two generations later. Would Jacob have been aware of that at, at Bethel when he had that, that dream? He oh, yes. That? God makes it quite clear that this is a ho this is, gives him the, the name Bethel, which means house of God, which means temple of God. Right? Altars are places. No, which uh, establish sanctuaries, holy places. Now, for us, this is, this is strange, but for people, the Israelites, this is, this is the most important part of this story, is the building of the altar. Now, you have difficulties with this, this here. Once again, Aboriginals, this makes perfect sense. Now, there's another dimension to the building of altars, because uh, according to pagan theology, to whom does the land belong? Not just to the Canaanites, but to the Canaanite gods and goddesses. So what God is doing by appearing to Abraham and telling him to build an altar there is to claim the land from whom? The Canaanite gods and goddesses. He's reclaiming the land for himself that had been stolen by these so-called gods. Now you need to know that in view of the story then later on in the Old Testament. Now Abraham, uh, uh, God not only makes uh, uh, these promises to Abraham, but he makes a covenant in which he binds himself, commits himself to keeping these promises. Now we come to a remarkable story in Genesis 15. Stephen, let's read it. Uh, unfortunately, we can't read the whole of it. Uh, let's. Oh, we look. We probably better read most of it. Um, can you just start reading? From chapter, chapter 15, 15, first of all, one to five. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said. O Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Okay, now, God reiterates the promise that, uh, of blessing, but in this case it all focuses on the fact that Abraham still has no children. He says, how can I possibly uh, uh, be the heir of all these promises? And God makes a very specific promise here that not only will Abraham have an heir, but that heir will be from his own body, his own son. 
and from his son there will be as many descendants as the stars of the sky. Uh, stars in the sky. Yes. Was it regular for servants if the master didn't have a son? Yes. To carry on the name and sense. That's right. About? Yes. What what the what the what the man would do was to adopt his servant, okay, so and so it'd be a, a adopted heir. Yeah. So, if you like, legally, Abraham had written out his will and saying, in the event that I should die, Eliezer is my son and he will then become my son and he will inherit everything I have. So, that's the, that, that's the situation. And so, would then he yes. stay Abraham as his father? Uh, yes, but in a different sense. He would be, you know, you, in the genealogy, he'd lose his father and Abraham would be his father, mm -hmm. as far for legal purposes. Yeah. No? God doesn't just make this promise, but God does something utterly, utterly amazing. Um, okay, Joshua, can you go on? From verse uh, 7, please. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? But right, now notice the focus is away from descendants to land. land. Yep. He said to him, Bring me a hyper three years old, a female goat three years old, and a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs, and shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your ancestors in peace, shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land. We just stop there, then it the extent of the lands mapped out. Now to understand this story and this very strange ceremony that's enacted here, this ritual, um, uh, you need to see, understand that this, this happened only once in the Bible. This is unique. Nothing like this happened before, nothing like this has happened since. Now what it does is takes uh, what was a fairly common ceremony in the ancient world uh, let's say, for example, you and I, uh, let's say, Josh, you and I wanted to, to make an absolutely binding commitment in which we put our lives on the line. You know, cross my heart and uh, swear to die kind of stuff. But not, not just as words, but as realities. What would ha happen is that we would go to a holy place and in the presence of a god, we would sacrifice animals. And those animals would be cut open in front of the altar. So you'd have the uh, god here, the altar. And the animals would uh, be cut out half by half. And we would walk down together in the presence of the god between the cut up animals and we would promise that we would uh, commit ourselves to something at the cost of our lives. Now just to say, just as these animals are dead, so if I break this commitment then I will die and I ask you, God, to kill me. Right? It's a very serious undertaking. Now what happens here? Things are turned on the head. Look for the unexpected. Can any of you see what's unexpected about what happens here? Yeah. God walks down. God walks down. And what does Abraham do? He's nothing. He's not only 
doing nothing, but he's asleep. And he's not just asleep, but he is in the deepest possible sleep. He does nothing. He receives it from God. And what does God do? God walks down, and by walking down, what does he do? Promises. He commits his life. He commits his life. God swears by himself, puts his life on the line. And he says, in effect, if I break this covenant, the promise to give you this land, then what? I will die. I will die. God puts his life on the line in the covenant he makes with Abraham. And you realize that God had to deliver that. Even if the people continually kept rebelling? That's right, because notice this is one-sided. Mm. What does Abraham do? What does God demand of Abraham? Nothing. Nothing. He's asleep. Well, we see that again later. What? I said we see that again, that type of thing later. Yeah. Right? Mm. Isn't this an amazing story? God puts his life on the line, commits himself to keeping his promise. He makes a covenant with Abraham. Now, this is the first cover, the second covenant in the Old Testament. The first covenant was with Noah. Take good note of these. You must get this in your head. Now, this is the second covenant. The previous one we today wasn't a covenant? No, because it's just promises. Okay. A covenant is... What's the difference just between a promise and a covenant? Uh, covenant's legally binding. Covenant is legally binding. It's, there's an extra level of legality and binding to it. You, uh, you know, as you know, you can always uh, modify promises, but as soon as you make a covenant of promise, then you cannot change it. You can't renege it. Uh, so it's a legally binding uh, agreement. Uh, notice the two things that God promises here to Abraham is a son from his own body, and the land of Canaan to him and his descendants. Notice too that God won't give the land to Abraham directly, but to his descendants. Now, as if that's not enough, a few chapters later, you get God's confirmation of the covenant. Now, the affirmation of it, the uh, 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 assurance of it. Let's go to chapter 17. And uh, some of this is now going to be fleshed out. Okay, who's next? Garth, I think you are the one. Uh, just read uh, verses 1 and 2. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you, and I will greatly increase your numbers. That, that'll do. Um, notice there are two, two commands that God gives to Abraham. The first one is walk before me. Um, in Hebrew, the idea is to walk in and out of my presence. So it means live in my presence as part of my household with access to me. So uh, be my personal deputy, my servant. The walk the person who walks before the king is his deputy. So uh, what uh, uh, God commissions Abraham is here to be his deputy. And secondly, to do so blamelessly with a good conscience. Now, th that's the commission that God gives to Abraham. Commissioning him to be his deputy, his servant, his uh, agent. The blamelessness, is that just the conscience? Because he hasn't given many laws yet. No, that's right. It's just conscience. Uh, to do so with integrity. It's just conscience. Do so blamelessly, serving faithfully. Right? So the, um, the, the emphasis is here on loyalty. Um, true and loyal servant. Now, keep going, please. Does that mean I'll leave? Uh, you can go on. Yes. You can't get out as easily as that. So close. Yes. Abram fell, down, fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. But a number one. Notice it's extended not just the father of one nation, but many, many nations. 
So, uh, not just one nation, many nations. Keep going. And no longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. Just stop there. God changes Abraham's name because he gives him a new mission. Abraham means exalted father, founding father, great father. So foundational father, patriarch. But now he's not just only going to be exalted father, but he's going to be Abraham, meaning father of many nations. Yes? Going back to the very first part when God calls Abraham to leave, the very first um, thing about you're going to be a great father, like Abraham, that's got to have been like a stigma yeah. his entire life. It's, so the exalted father, you have got no kids. Yep. Can you see there's just so much here? There's so many ironies. There's so much that's unexpected. And fatherless man, I mean, a man who has no children is called founding father, exalted father, great father, patriarch. Keep going. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Just stop there. God promises to be their God. Um, now, uh, this is, number one is God's commitment to them, but it's also a practical commitment to them. He promises to serve them as their God um, and to act as their God. Probably that's the best way of translating English to act as their God and to do whatever people look for a God to do. Which means that uh, they are going to have access to them. Him. Now, that promise of God that he will be the God not only of Abraham but also his descendants is fulfilled at the covenant of Sinai when God gives the Israelites the priesthood and the tabernacle and the divine service. That's where God acts as their God. Keep going. The whole land of Canaan, for you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So God commits himself to be their God. He gives them the land. He uh, has already given the blessing uh, that's specified. Uh, they not, uh, not only will Abraham be a great nation, but many nations, many kings will come from Abraham. And one final thing, this is an everlasting, it's a perpetual covenant. Now as a sign of the covenant, as a means by which uh, not only Abraham, but also his descendants receive all this from God in faith, God tells Abraham to circumcise himself and his male sons. Now, um, uh, just very quickly, there's a lot here. Uh, what God does is takes what an existing ceremony, which was male circumcision. As you know, circumcision is removing the foreskin from the male penis. Now, everywhere in the ancient world, not everywhere, but wherever it's practiced in the ancient world and modern world, it's a man-making ceremony. It occurs when? Hopefully at birth. No, it never does. No, no, no Aboriginal males circumcised at birth. It's, it's part of initiation into adulthood. It's part of a male initiation ceremony. So much so that for Aborigines, any Aboriginal man who's not circumcised is still a boy. Um, very funny experience of being in Central Australia back years ago when there's a very prominent Aboriginal person who was working with the government called Charles per Charlie Perkins. Um, you remember him? Uh, they referred to him because he had his roots back in Central Australia, uh, his, his background at least on one side of his family. They spoke to him about that boy. That boy. Why? Because he was uninitiated. He hadn't been circumcised. Um, therefore, he can't be married. Therefore, he's not a full adult male. Now, what's ironical about God 
telling Abraham to circumcise Isaac and Ishmael eight days? They're not men yet. They're just kids and not just kids, but babies. So God makes babies what? Men. Men. Yeah, partners. The recipients of his covenant. He treats them as uh, as if they were adults. Is, is that to go against the canon of practice of um, sacrificing children, child sacrifice yes. and stuff like yes. that? So that's a direct... It's a direct yeah. counter to that. Yeah. Oh, and many other things as well. I know. Right. So how do... It's to the present day. How does a person who is a descendant of Abraham become a son of the covenant, which is enter the covenant, become a beneficiary of all these promises through circumcision. circumcision. And if you're not circumcised, then you aren't... You're not part of the covenant. You're not part of the family. You're still outside the family. You enter the family, not not a human family, but whose family? If God tells Abraham to do it, Abraham's God's Agent, therefore, what family does a descendant of Abraham enter when they are circumcised? God's family, God's um, God's people. Now, the term people, which you find again and again, is kins folk, uh, family, extended family. Now, what is the Christian? Fulfillment of circumcision? Baptism. Baptism. Um, By the way, here you get one of the strongest arguments for infant baptism. Um, In baptism, we don't just put off, as I read somewhere, quite wittily and rudely, we don't just put off part of the old boy, but all the old boy. All the old man is put off. And a new identity is assumed. Right, so uh, circumcision is the sign of the covenant. Now, sign, can I just say sign here is not just an indication that you belong to the covenant. It's sign in the sense as the means by which you actually uh, enter it. So the marriage ceremony is not a sign that you are married, but it actually marries you. So circumcision is not just a sign that you belong to the people of God, but it's the means by which you become part of the people of God. Uh, it's very closely related to you know, the term that we call sacrament, but that's overloading this. So it's a sign uh, which not only says, I, I belong to God's family, but it's also the means by which then you enter God's family. Okay, then questions on that? There's so much here that I can just open up for you uh, that you'll have to fill out in due course. Uh, Okay, now, yes. uh, From here onwards, then, the story of Abraham and his descendants is the story of blessing. And how God's blessing is passed on. How God's blessing, which is given to Abraham, works itself out in concrete circumstances. And you know the story. It's a very funny story because uh, uh, Abraham initially has no children. And Sarah tries to help God out by giving Hagar to him, uh, 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 that's her maidservant, to sleep with so that he can have a child from her. And... uh, so that he will have a male heir. And he has a male heir. And who's that male heir? Ishmael. Ishmael. But God makes it quite clear that Ishmael is not the bearer of this promise. Sarah then finally, eventually, in old age, when she's past childbearing, past menopause, has a son, Isaac, okay, who is the bearer of blessing. And then who does the blessing go from to? From Isaac? Isaac has two sons. His wife, Rebecca, is initially infertile again. Notice all these infertile women. women. Uh, uh, Sarah's infertile. Rebecca's infertile. She prays to God. And God, you've got to watch out what you pray for. 
because she gets a double answer to her prayer and she gets twins and she has the most horrible pregnancy that any woman's ever had because right from the beginning she has the mother of all morning sicknesses and what happens is she turns out to have twins and they are there jostling within her womb and so much so that she has one of those strange pregnancies where instead of you know, if you have a, uh, usually if you have twins first one is delivered and then another delivered but here both of them are delivered in the same contraction and what happens is that the first one that comes out is Esau the name indicates what he looks like and what he looked like at birth he was the hairy one hair all over his body Esau means hairy hairy man hairy kid and then what's happening as the delivery occurs the second baby has hanging on to the ankle of Esau holding on with his fist to try and pull him back to try and make sure that he doesn't get ahead of him <laughs> and that's where Jacob gets his name from Jacob means Deceiver. well in the secondary sense but most literally somebody who takes somebody by the heel <laughs> which is a dirty fighter <laughs> right? a dirty fighter is you know a tricky fighter instead of out in the front you know, face to face you get from behind and you trip them up <laughs> so acting tapping should be allowed in rugby then. Sorry? <laughs> if your name's Jacob. Yeah. Acting tapping should be allowed in rugby then. You're talking too fast for me here. Acting tapping should be allowed in rugby then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, and remember then that he has his name changed to, to Israel, which means one who fights with God, God fighter. Um, uh, no, and then so, uh, but then strangely, all his life, Jacob wants to he wants to be in front he realizes that his brother Esau is the oldest therefore he stands in line to get the birthright the inheritance the blessing and he tries to outwit everybody including God to get the blessing the irony is it's all useless. it's all in vain because God has already decided what it's him anyway it's him anyway so all that effort is wasted but isn't that typical of us? We fight with God to get what God has already promised to give us. That's the story of my life. Uh, and then, it, it's funny, then Jacob, all of a sudden, then uh, there's some funny stuff. Jacob gets two wives. There's the wife that he didn't want, Leah. She's the fertile one. And there's Rebecca, the one that he really loves, who is infertile. But Rebecca eventually has two children, and when she uh, gives birth to the last one, she dies, Benjamin. Um, okay? And then he, there's two concubines that he has, and he has 12 sons, from which you get the 12 tribes uh, of Israel. But you'd expect the, the older son to get the blessing. But there's two special blessings. The blessing goes, the blessing of kingship goes to number four, Judah. And the the greatest blessing in the land goes first to Joseph, who's the firstborn son of Rachel. But then Joseph has twins, Ephraim and no, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh's the older, Ephraim's the younger. Who gets the blessing? The greater blessing? The younger one. Huh? Now, all the while through, God gives blessing, but uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob don't possess the land as you'd expect everywhere in the ancient world blessing comes through family and land how much land do they own no that's not true when Abraham died he owned one little piece of land his cemetery at Hebron that's the only piece of land that Abraham Isaac Jacob owned in the promised land now that's the big story uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, let me just deal with a bit of it and then we'll have... A, no, I'd like to finish this, if you don't mind, and have the break then at the end of that. Do you mind that? Yeah, that's so, uh, notice then, first of all, right from the beginning, there's threats to God's blessing of Abraham and Sarah. Now, Sarah's an important part of it, because the blessing doesn't just go to Abraham, but also Sarah. Okay, uh, uh, there's a threat from two kings who fancy Sarah and want to uh, uh, 
get her as their concubines within their royal harems. She's 65. She's a pretty good looker, though. <laughs> Uh, there's no problem there. First, the king of Egypt, when Abraham's down there, uh, almost immediately after he's in the land, there's a drought, he goes down to Egypt, and there's problems there. And then later on, there's the king of Gerar. Uh, then there's the problems with Sarah and Hagar. Sarah tries to manipulate God's blessing, but God doesn't allow the manipulation, and yet still the blessing goes because Ishmael is blessed. So he's not a cursed person, despite what Sarah does and Hagar does. He is still blessed. Um, but the greatest threat to God's blessing, um, from a human point of view, is God's command to sacrifice Isaac. What's funny about God's command to sacrifice Isaac? Um, Abraham has finally got a son. Yep. And God wants to take him away. And therefore, what does God do? God's command contradicts his blessing. promise, his blessing. And the remarkable thing is that God is prepared, I mean, Abraham trusts in God and follows God's command, even where God's command contradicts his promises. Can you see how strange that is? Uh, and at the last minute, you know the story, you have a substitution that occurs on that mountain. That mountain where this occurs is Mount Jerusalem, Mount Zion, um, where a animal is provided for the son. Um, uh, God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son and God himself provides a sacrifice by giving this ram for sacrifice. Yes? I just find it interesting because today we're told that only we're sent to God or what we think is God is if it lines up with scripture yes. or what God's already said but that didn't really line up with what God had already said so but uh, did he see God or uh, yeah, No, God told him. No, that's not the thing because uh, Within scripture, you get God's commands quite often seem to contradict his mm. promises. And this is, this, is, this is the strange part of it. Uh, you know, just take, for example, a very simple one. Jesus says, you shall be or you will be perfect as I am perfect. Um, that's the one hand, and yet he says, your sins are forgiven you. Be perfect, your sins are forgiven you. You have the command, the law, and then the promises. Now, there's so much here uh, that I can't possibly open up, but just be aware of some of the basic dynamics. Yes? And the other thing, I've, I've just realised that, that, and I've read this so many times, um, Jacob, uh, Isaac, is Abraham and Isaac go to a mountain. Yes. Whereas all the other times, when it comes to a place, yes. he's on the planet. That's right. And so there's, there's that different context. Different, different context. Different. Always take... Uh, we modern people aren't very much interested in genealogies, but also places. Yeah. Uh, places are very significant. It's significant where things occur. So this mountain, notice at the end of that story, the sacrifice of it, if there's something on the mountain of the Lord... Uh, uh, God, either God will provide or God will be seen. The mountain of the Lord. Now it's unnamed because it's only later on you find out what is the mountain of the Lord. We go on further. Sinai is the mountain of the Lord. But it doesn't remain the mountain of the Lord. What becomes the mountain of the Lord? Zion, Jerusalem. Uh, it's interesting, it's unnamed here. It's only later on that it is named. This yeah. is probably one of the most beautiful things I ever heard in scripture. And I just cried when I read it. The mountain, which thing? The mountain yes. on which Abraham was called, that God showed him. He said, yes. go to the mountain, I'll show you. And the son carried the wood yes. up the mountain That's right. the, to be sacrificed on himself. That's the same mountain, same place where Jesus Christ right. Okay. Where and this is not the only son. He is. He's not the only. He's not the only son of Abraham, but he's the only son of the father. And you see, what God commands, which is to sacrifice the son, is the command that God Himself fulfilled by giving His son. And, um, and so God Himself provides the sacrifice on the mountain, and as a result of it, God is seen on the mountain of the Lord. 
Now, one of the ways of translating the Hebrew, he will be seen. Where do we see God? Jesus. In Jesus, and not in his glory, but Jesus hanging on the cross. That's what all the Gospels say. the same the mountain that Isaac was sacrificed It's the same mountain, yes. It's the same mountain that Jesus was crucified on. Yes, it's, Mount, it's Jerusalem, Mount Zion, Golgotha. It's all that mountain, Calvary. Um, right, threats to the blessing... Uh, and then notice, thirdly, secondly, Abraham, Jacob's struggle for blessing. He's a fighter. Scrappy little so-and-so. Um, uh, he is fighting for blessing. And notice here the big picture stuff. First of all, um, it starts off with the womb. He wants to make sure that he gets ahead of Esau. However, he is second born. And so he has a chip on the shoulder right from the start. And uh, you remember the story of how Esau is the hunter, the hairy one. He's been hunting for a week or so, comes home, hu hungry as a horse. Uh, Jacob conveniently has a pot of stew on the fire when he sees that uh, Esau's coming, smelling heavenly. And then uh, he tricks Esau into selling his birthright. Now, what does birthright mean? There's different things. Possession, the whole, the whole box of dollars. It's the whole inheritance. Yeah. Um, but the firstborn son is, inherits the family name, the family blessing. He and family is the family status. He gets, in, in terms of if there's two sons, the firstborn son gets two thirds of the property, the secondborn only a third. But the important thing is that uh, he is the head of the family. Um, as if he can buy a birthright. Um, and you remember then, he tries, he together with Rebecca's help, tries when um, Isaac's dying. Tries to get the blessing. He not only tries to get the blessing, but yes. through trickery, he actually gets his father's blessing. So there's a struggle in the womb, buying the birthright, the trickery to get his father's blessing, and as a, res as a result of that, he's got to flee for his life. Esau is hopping mad, and rightly so, and is out to get him. Um, uh, and then, strangely, God's blessing goes with him. God's blessing doesn't just apply to Jacob in the land of Canaan, but applies when he goes to Haran, his father-in-law. And the whole story of his time there is the story of God's blessing coming to him in strange circumstances. Then the next story is when he's coming back to the promised land with his two wives and his sons and all his flocks and herds. They come to the entrance of the land, a place, J Jabok, where they leave Syria, present-day Syria, and they enter the land of Canaan. Uh, Jacob hears that Esau's coming to meet him, to meet him. Uh, and typical Jacob, he puts the flocks out in front and then he puts Leah and her sons, he puts the servants after that and then he puts Leah and her entourage and then he puts Rachel and where is he? Right, right at the back. <laughs> yeah, it's just typical Jacob, he plays it safe. Um, and then something strange happens. He's the last to ford this river which, from which he passes into the promised land. And in the middle of the river, somebody stops him in the dark of night. And all night long, uh, this person is fighting with him, trying to stop him from crossing the river Jabok. Um, and uh, at the end of it, he, uh, uh, Jacob seems to be losing. His hip is put out of joint. He can't wrestle anymore. Once your hip's put out of joint, wrestling, all that you can do is hang on for dear life. And he's hanging on. He's, he's got the person in a deadlock. He can't win. He can't get rid of him, but he's holding on. And uh, light is beginning to dawn. And the person he's wrestling with says... Let me go, for the day is breaking. And Jacob, the penny drops. He realises who it is he's reckoning with. He says, I will not let you, let you go unless you bless me. And strangely, the stranger blesses him and gives him a new name, Ishmael. But for the rest of his life, 
uh, Israel rather, yes. meaning yes. one who fights with God and wins. One who fights with God and wins. What did Abraham win? I mean, not what did not Abraham? What did Jacob win? It was God's blessing. <laughs> huh? Very strange story is this. So had, but he had already gotten the blessing from his father. That was God's blessing. But he hadn't got it from God himself. The assurance. Huh? But he, he's, he's already accumulated on this blessing. That's, well. that's like, right, but that's not what counts. What yes. counts is yeah. God's blessing. Why are we wrestling with God in no physical sense, getting it the blessing later? Well, it's not the wrestling, it's the word. He, he gets a commitment, a word from the person he's wrestling with. He says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And the person he's wrestling with then he blesses him. And he calls the name Peniel, of the place Peniel, because he realises that that stranger he's been wrestling with is the Lord. Uh, Peniel means face of God. So is that Jesus? Yes, from a New Testament point of view, yes. Um, lastly, um, God gives Abraham his, I'm um, not Abraham, Jacob his blessing, despite all this stuff. Um, and notice that Jacob is not a, a, a nice man. He's not your paragon of virtue. He's a tricky, slippery, calculating kind of a guy um, who's very jealous of his brother, who manipulates his father, who manipulates his father-in-law to get what he wants. Uh, let's have a look at the two passages where God blesses him. Uh, Levi... Uh, first of all, chapter 28, 10 through to 17, the story of uh, Jacob's, so-called Jacob's ladder. Uh, chapter 28, this one here, where am I? 10 through to 17. Yes, it's Jacob's dream of battle. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There, above it, stood the Lord. Just stop there. Notice above it, it's probably wrong. Notice the variant reading beside him or beside it. The story doesn't make sense if God is on top of the stairway, but God is at the bottom of the stairway, next to the ladder and next to Jacob. So what's the picture here? You get a stairway coming from heaven to earth. Jacob's lying down here, sleeping, uh, sleeping on the ground, and God is here. In his dream. And uh, angels descend and ascend there because this is the place where heaven and earth meet. Okay, keep going. So, there beside it, the Lord was there. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. The descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you can spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the great gate of heaven. Notice the gate of heaven. Ziggurats were the gate into heaven. Bethel means house of God. The most important part of this uh, story is in verse 14. God promises all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your seed, your offspring. So what God does is takes the promise that he gave to Abraham and applies it to Jacob. 
Now, Luther explains this quite well, and it's a great <coughs> significant. He says Jacob's ladder is not the ladder by which Jacob goes up to heaven, but it's the ladder by which God comes down to earth to meet with Jacob on earth. Um, and he goes on to say, this is a picture of what happens in the divine service. In worship, we don't go up the ladder to heaven, but God comes down the ladder to meet with us in order to bless us. Now you need to know that Bethel was one of the most important and ancient places of worship in Israel. Um, Shechem, Bethel were the two ancient ones. Jerusalem came later on in the story. Do they still know where it is? Sorry? Do they still know where Bethel is? Oh yes. Yes. Uh, that's a uh, very clearly identified site and it's been excavated. Oh. Lastly, before the break, notice that th uh, this is before Jacob goes to uh, the land of the uh, city of Haran. Uh, yeah, uh, Dylan, you're the next one. After God has re uh, Jacob has returned to the promised land, 35? 35. 35. God appears... To, uh, to Jacob at Bethel again. So you get Bethel both ends of the journey. Before he leaves, he's at Bethel. When he comes back, he fulfills his promise that he will offer God a tenth of everything he has at Bethel. This is a fulfillment of that promise. No, from uh, 9. We, I'd like to read all of it, but let's read 9 to 12. That's the guts of it. After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. Notice again, after the first time was when he left the promised land. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel, so he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I give to Abraham and Isaac, I give also, I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Okay, that's the God's appearance. Notice that two times in his life God appears to Abraham and both of those times is Bethel. And uh, here God appears and says, I am God Almighty. That's the same name that God used when he appeared to Abraham. Remember when God appeared, he says, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be perfect. That's chapter uh, 19. Now God does this, but he adds something which is new. He says, be fruitful and increase in, number. increase in number. To whom had God first said that? Abraham. No. Abraham. No. Abraham. Adam and Eve. Adam. And then after Adam, who was the second person to whom God said, be fruitful and multiply? Noah. Noah. Because Noah was a new Adam, a second Adam, and now comes a third, third Adam. Not of the old humanity, but of the new humanity. From Jacob comes a new humanity. Uh, so it's to Jacob. Notice those three times in which that, prom that, that, that blessing is given. Be fruitful and increase in number. Let's have a break and then we'll tie this up.